Thank you for staying with us. You're still watching The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Right now, it's time for our hot topic. And this talks about Ningi and what's happening in the Senate. So our hot topic says, recall Ningi immediately, Serap tells Akpabio. And joining us to have a conversation is Kolawali Uluwadari. He's the Deputy Director, Serap. Good morning, Kolawali. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Lovely. Okay, so we've seen what has happened in the Senate over the past week from the suspension of, um, Sen of the Senator Ningi um, to the budget pardon of about, according to him, about 3.7 because the initial budget, he says, was 25 trillion naira. However, the federal government has come out to say, no, the initial budget was about 27.8 um, or so trillion naira, so or 27.9 thereabout, and it's not 25 according to Ninge. So we're seeing all of this, and I mean, you are from Serap, you're the de deputy director of Serap. I want to just get your thoughts on all of this, how it even started, and what was your initial reaction to all of this when you're hearing of budget padding? Like, how do we have one budget um, being approved and signed, and then you're seeing another one being implemented? Thank you very much. I think we need to be able to get beyond the, uh, the controversial value of this subject and look at the accountability aspect. Mm. Uh, putting the things that you have called and the ultimate victims in mind. What Senator Nindi is saying is that. The budget, as it were, contains items that need not be there. It doesn't mean we have two budgets. Mm -hmm. So that is the pre that is the reason why we are taking this uh, position of writing to the Senate president, asking the Senate president to refer these allegations because they remain allegations as as far as uh, 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 criminality is concerned to the ICC and the EFCC to investigate these allegations. And perhaps if individuals are found culpable, and then they would have faced a law. That would also mean a recovery of any funds that either disposed or planned to be dis uh, disposed. And that is the least the National Assembly can do in this instance. And just a bit of clarity for, for context. The proposed budget by the executive of the National Assembly was uh, just a, a bit above 27 trillion. 27.5, actually. Making it. Um, 28 trillion. Mm -hmm. But there is an aspect of the budget called the GOEs, which is government owned enterprises, which by practice, government has always avoided a breakdown of the budget of the GOEs. So the, the budget, we just have one budget for 2024. The Appropriation Act, if you can get that on the website of the Budget Office of the Federation, it's just one. It is 28 trillion. But the segment for the government of the enterprises was not initially published. In fact, what you have published presently is a proposed budget of government to uh, enterprises, which amounts to over just three billion. So when you put the 25 billion and the three trillion together, you have 28.2 uh, trillion or so. And that is the budget. The main issue, there are two issues perhaps that we need to highlight is the opacity in the nature of the budget and what is uh, the zonal intervention projects, which is called consensus projects. Those two issues are distinct, but they form what we see as a budget party in Nigeria, which is not a new phenomenon. In fact, Sarah had gone to court in 2017, and Justice Idris, Mohamed Idris of the Federal Court Lagos, and then was a judgment in favor of Sarah in 2018. Compelling the president then, uh, President Buhari, to investigate and make sure that those who are found culpable, the same thing we're doing now presently, actually, who are culpable of budget party at that time should uh, face the law. Of course, government did not enforce that judgment. And now, to the two issues I've mentioned, the zonal intervention project and the opacity in the budget, in the budget process. What we call zonal intervention projects is what is also called successive projects, which is patently unlawful. There is no law that allows legislators to propose and incite projects. Really, the three arms of government are distant and clear, and that is what the principle of separation of balance. So of course, checks and balances comes in somewhere in between. But the legislator's job is primarily to make laws, while the executive's job is, and both other things, to propose the budget and implement it. And for the record, this National Assembly inserted more than 7,000 projects in the 2024 budget. In fact, it was 7,442 projects that was inserted. Is that not alarming? Was that not called the question? If the executive had proposed and have presented the budget that they had in their own wisdom, term the budget of renewed hope, 
And then the National Assembly reviewed the budget as part of the assignment duties, inserted more than 7,000 projects. How does that fit into the plan of the president uh, for return of whatever that means? That is completely unlawful. National Assembly has powers to review the budget also. But why would they insert more than 7,000 projects? It's against the background that in budget and National Assembly, the executive had the amount in 100 billion avenue for what is called lunar intervention projects, which is extremely unlawful. But the National Assembly went and on two trillion on the on zonal intervention projects. Now, what is more alarming, which I think Nigerians should be interested in, is that most of these allocations to ministries, department, and agencies are even allocated to MTAs that don't have the technical expertise to carry on these jobs. For instance, what's the business of the Ministry of Agriculture? in constructing roads or buying vehicles in Lagos State. Mm -hmm. And all this is in the budget. Which is why we have these kind of conversations. The ultimate aim is not to be political. It's not to divide Nigerians. But we're calling Nigerians to be part of this governance process. The mm -hmm. budget that we're talking about is on the website of the Budget Office of the Federation. I invite every Nigerian to download this budget and check it line by line. Of course, it's more than 1,000 pages. But you can see these things I'm talking about. And that would bring up the question. Whether there is budget padding or not, why would the National Assembly insert more than 7,000 projects in the budget. Now, why are these projects inserted in ministries that really do not have the competence to carry out these actions? Ultimately, these are the common wealth of Nigerians and to be used for our common children. Uh, these will not do Nigerians any good. And ultimately, we all become victims mm. of these uh, malfeasance in government, which is showing itself clearly now in, in the budget process. All right, so you talked about the project. I mean, I would definitely want to read up what the budget is like um, and seeing all of these lines that you're talking about. So if we're seeing 7,000 projects, I want to believe, you know, is for the good of Nigerians. But do you think it's even a way to cut costs? Because currently, economically, we're not really doing good. We're not in the best position. And I think, you know, the economic analysts would say that. So are we not supposed to be trying ways to, you know, even cut costs than padding up or adding more things with this government-owned um, enterprises and the projects that they're putting that we still don't have an idea about? Because, like you said, why would the Ministry of Agriculture be trying to do roads and bus? That should be maybe Ministry of Works and all. But obviously, everybody is just trying to get things to say, okay, I have this project, I have that, and looking for ways to put money. So shouldn't, in this whole thing called governance, Shouldn't our politicians, the senators, the, the president, and you know, even the governors, shouldn't we be finding ways to actually cut costs, especially when it comes to our budget? Instead of adding all of these projects that they probably even know nothing about or it's not connected to their own ministries. So that is the question Nigerians should be asking. And again, just for context, the capital expenditure of the Ministry of our Greek was just over 300 billion naira, specifically 332 billion naira. By the time the National Assembly has inserted projects, it amounted to more than 900 billion naira. And then, just like the question you have asked, where are we getting the money to pursue these projects, number one? Number mm -hmm. two, are these projects really necessary? And do they fit into the overall plan of the government being led by the president to ensure that Nigerians get the benefits of good governance that he has started to renew law? And to ask the question, why did he sign this budget into law? Knowing the various inflations that would impede the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the in, in, in implementing the budget according to the plan he has, that also makes the president focus in, in a way but ultimately, we, the Nigerian people, are the victims of these practices. Zonal intervention projects should be discontinued, which also formed the basis of our request in the National Assembly that the President and the Senate leadership to make a commitment to continue this practice. It simply allows for corruption. Even if it's not corrupt in itself, it encourages and allows corruption. And then signing projects to ministries that do not have the competence to do them, which is also an indication of corruption. And that, as you have hinted, and, and I do totally agree, that for this, we do not have this. Do not have this to prosecute to uh, implement this budget. <laughs> the budget that is uh, almost nine trillion, to, uh, to, uh, we do not have the, 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 the funds to implement this budget. We have to borrow. So, why are we spending so much unnecessarily and wastefully in the midst of poverty? 
More <laughs> than 80 million, more than 80 million Nigerians are still poor. Does this administration have any plans to leave this in the of poverty? What is the correlation of these 7,000 women to lifting the Nigerians out of poverty? And that is the question. We need to get beyond the politics, the rather political semantics going on in the National Assembly, the North against South, and perhaps individuals that feel aggrieved about uh, how the Nigerians will share. And that is the issue. The issue is about accountability right. and the involvement of people in the government. Schools. A very critical part that I should quickly mention is when this appropriation bill was being considered, was there a public hearing? The Nigerians had the opportunity to weigh in? Did they even see the budget lines at the time it was being discussed at the National Assembly to be able to point out what should be and what should not? These are all issues that have allowed these things to go on for too long. And it really should stop. Now it should stop. Mm. <laughs> well, so talking about projects, something that I just remembered was the fact that the FCT minister about a few weeks ago had come out to say he wanted to build the largest water park in Africa. I don't know if you saw that news. And to me, it was a little bit ridiculous because I said, is this what we really need at this point? I mean, people are looking for how to feed. People are just looking for how to get by. And your own pet project is probably a water park. I understand if you're saying you want to use it for tourism, which is great. I mean, that's supposed to get revenue for the country. But then do we even have the security to ask people to come in? So just thinking about the project is just almost like I see it as misplaced priorities sometimes with all of these projects that they try to, to bring up. But then um, my question now is, if we think that we have so much money, right, or maybe sometimes maybe they might be tone deaf, they don't know what's going in the country, they don't know people are suffering, how are we supposed to fund all of this? And there is a little report that says an average Nigerian owes about three thousand dollars money that i haven't seen i'm probably owing because when you think about when you think about our debt profile it's so much and so every single day they come up with this monies that they want to do this they want to do that and then we have to probably borrow again but let's just bring it back to um ningi's suspension some people would argue and say that ningi said the right thing but he said it at the wrong time, or he said it in a wrong way. Do you agree with that? I do not agree with that. And that's what I said earlier, that we need to get beyond the political, um, the political issues, the tribal religious issues. No, this is about governments. And our view is to look at this from the governance and accountability perspective, which is how every Nigerian should look at it. These are commonwealths, and these are things that we use for our good in governance. And so it goes beyond the motive of Senator Ningi. The whistleblower policy that Nigeria presently uses, because of course we do not have a substantive whistleblower law. Of course, consider Senator Ningi's question is this. Has he made allegations of corruption? Yes. Has he also mentioned names and mentioned specific? Yes, he has. So the least the government can do. And in this instance, government will be in the leadership of the National Assembly is to invite the corrupt agencies to look at the allegations he has made. So of course, ICPC and the FCC, they could not see any wrong way, none of us. So that is the But he is a whistleblower that has made allegations of corruption. That should be investigated and not set under the carpet. We also know that this is not the first time this issue that is coming up, which is why the leadership of the National Assembly, rather than react by suspending Ningi, or Nigerians reacting to say that Ningi had done the right thing in the wrong way, is it not serious? Mm -hmm. Allegation. Is it being investigated either by the National Assembly or by anti corruption agencies? The answer is no. So, why do we want to stop people from exposing corruption as well? But in an administration that sees ideas fighting corruption. So it is not about how he has done it, when he, he did it, or where he is from. It is about what he has said. And that's why I say that even the laws consider Senator Nigi in this instance as a whistleblower, the Article 33 of the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, with Nigeria as a that mandates Nigeria as a state party to ensure that we lack laws and processes that protect and promote people coming forward uh, to uh, to blow the whistle on national corruption, which is what Senator Nikki had done. So add to that is the fact that this suspension has deprived people is representing of the right to have someone in the National Assembly who will represent them. Well, of course, it goes against the basics, the basis of having uh, someone in the next the first place. The actions of the legislator is not right, and it's something that should be condemned by all Nigerians. 
So with him being suspended, would you now say that obviously because he has blown the whistle, you know, opening this kind of worms that is going on in the National Assembly, they're just trying to push him out and say, you know what, you are a bad egg to us. Do you think that's what's happening? And they're just trying to punish him for doing the right thing. Be the motive uh, of the National Assembly suspending him, but for me, it, it's still wrong. He has, uh, he has made allegations of corruption which the National Assembly has not tried to look at. That they have not even uh, referred that to as corruption. Well, case, maybe because they are all they are all in it together, so they definitely know that that's what's going on. So they're not looking at and it, because, happy, not because they don't know. They're not looking at it because they don't want it exposed. Which is why I'm happy that this is in the public domain now, and Nigerians are talking about this. The IRCPC and the FCC. And the president himself, of course, is watching the drama that is unfolding in the National Assembly. Which is why they should step in. In the letter that we wrote to the National Assembly, we've also copied ICPC, FCC, the president at the, the Attorney General of the Federation. They should be able to step in to do their investigation. Just because corruption is being alleged in the National Assembly, it does not repeat uh, the ICPC and the FCC for investigating these allegations and making sure that they get the root of it. So if the National Assembly as a whole is not interested, interested, pardon me, in investigating this issue, anti-corruption agencies and the president as the head of government should be able to authorize an investigation to ensure that Nigerians, uh, that, that we understand what is going on. And that if individuals are culpable, they should face a lot, it's important here. Yeah. That these funds that would otherwise have been wasted or stolen are diverted to protests that would benefit Nigerians, who are ultimately presently assistants, the victims of, 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 of this of this wrong yeah. Okay, so where do we go from here? I know you're big on accountability. I mean, that's what SERAP stands for, um, being accountable. And as, as of right now, I think there is a trust deficit between the Nigerian citizens and the government, right? So you would expect some form of transparency with the government to say, okay, you know what, this is exactly what it is. This is what we want to use these monies for. Even if you have to borrow, because some people will tell you that borrowing is good, but as long as you're borrowing for the right reasons, you're not borrowing to just be frivolous. You're not borrowing to spend ridiculously. You're borrowing to ensure that, okay, you're doing the right thing. You can make more money and pay the debt. But in this case, we're seeing that year in, year out, we keep borrowing every single time and we're unable to even pay our debts. So what is the way forward now? How, does, how can the government start to build that trust with his people? Thank you very much. I would rather talk to people at the same time as we're having this conversation with government. Government, I want to talk of government. Government is not one uh, foreign body that we do not know. We know the government. Yes. We know what we refer to as government. It starts with the president and it ends with the least public officer in any public institution in Nigeria, including those who are elected or appointed. It includes everybody in public office. They have taken a vote of office that clearly states what they should do and what they shouldn't do. We have a code of conduct in the constitution that clearly describes how each public officer should do his or her job. These things they know. I think what is important now is for the people to understand their roles, citizens. That our role does not start and end every four years in the election cycle, including the off cycle elections, mm. or when we cast our ballot. Our role as citizens participating in governance continues. It doesn't stop for one day. We need to hold those in government accountable. Two things about how they use public funds and the powers that they have, and now transparent the processes. Just why it's not so important what the motive of any government official is. Accountability means you're able to explain to the people what's the process. Uh, the people involved in the budget process, in this instance, in the 2020 Appropriation Act, the answer is no. That is wrong. The people should have been involved at the, at the public hearing stage in the National Assembly. What about the implementation of the budget itself? When the people involved to ensure that the old public officers are accountable throughout the MPs are going to implement those processes. Over the years, Nigerians have not done enough of that. And it's like organizations mess around really a lot in this regard to make sure that Nigerians participate. So what I'm preaching to the choir as it were, talking to government, which I've been doing, which of course forms the basis of the advocacy we do from time to time, mm -hmm. that it also I need to engage so that they understand the importance of holding government to account. And that all government to account is not about being political. It's not about the political alignment. It has to do with your tribe, your religion, or who you like or you yeah. like. No. 
It is about the Commonwealth and the benefit of holding people to account, which is why conversations like this very important. Uh, you guys in the media are doing the best you can. Nigerians must be informed beyond the rather mundane uh, uh, issues of tribe politics or where Ninki is from or what he has said. Oh, that's not important. This is wrong. The budget process is not transparent. These monies are being will be wasted ultimately if they are implemented. And Nigerians need to be able to speak out to ensure that the right is stop. But if we do that, because you've seen cases in the past, for instance, Sarah comes all the time, and I know you guys are always slamming lawsuits um, <laughs> here and there. This is just me being, making light of the situation. If we do that, most times, you know, it falls onto the ground. Most times, nothing is being done. So how can we start to even seize our power? Because obviously, the office of the citizen should have some form of supremacy. But we live in a country whereby you say all of these things, you talk about it, and sometimes people are there to just bring you down because you're talking against the government. So how can we start to wield um, the power that we have to ensure that they have no choice to listen to us and make sure that things are being done the right way? It's a continuous process. It's still we cannot afford to give up. Uh, Seraph is just a group of Nigerians who have come together since 2004 to ensure that the writing is done in government. So we have a lot of citizens who do not even incorporate the suicide organizations and are doing so much more wonderful, even much more than Seraph. We need to encourage these people and we need to get more people on board. It is not a spring, unfortunately. It's a morale. We need to continue. But much more importantly, which is why discussions like this are important. The citizens need to understand that they are rights holders. They have the right to ensure that those in public offices, who we call the duty bearers, owe a duty to them to use the power in favor of people. That's the basis of the social contract theory. It is, a, it is one thing for the people to know they have this power. It is another thing to be able to use it objectively and not subjectively. So not because the person is from the north or south or belongs to a particular tribe, or perhaps he's even, he's even, he or she is of the same religious talk as well. People need to know that constance is governance. Administration is administration. Translation and accountability, they go beyond all these basic uh, sentiments, which is why we need to continue these kind of conversations. It is advocacy that is aimed at educators and citizens, learning and not learning what they've learned over the years, mm. and learning what they ought to do, and at the same time, preaching to, to the choir, as I've said, telling government officials what they should do. Not because perhaps they do not know, but to remind them of what they should do in the interest of people. So really, it's not something that's probably going to happen in a day, and we cannot afford to give up. Which is why, like Sarah, Nigerian citizens need to have that resilience to continue to hold government to account. The president and his administration wants Nigerians to be resilient in bearing with the economic action. But much more importantly beyond that, Nigerians need to have that resilience to continue to engage and demand accountability uh, without feeling either cheated or without even feeling like they, uh, they will stand out as being political. It's all part of the governance processes. We, we cannot see that uh, enough. Mm. Okay, so bringing it back to Senator Ningi's suspension, Sarap has called for him to be reinstated, right? Because I think it's a three-month suspension thereabout. Do you think this would happen? Um, and if they don't reinstate him, what is Sarah going to do about that? I think we need to uh, separate Sarah from the citizens. We have started this initiative as a group of citizens. We have started this. Nigerians are talking about this. It's not only Sarah. Yes. Of course, we have the right, just like every Nigerian, to go to court to enforce the rights that we have. That is clearly shown in Section 6 of the Constitution, which allows the judiciary to be the final arbiter to determine what's right and wrong, what's the duties and obligations of citizens vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, government institutions and government officials. We've got to, to do the right, to uh, compel the government to do the right thing if they do not hit this call. But much more importantly, citizens need to take up this advocacy and press it all. Anyone in the National Assembly, Senate President, represents a consensus in Nigeria, where they represent thousands or perhaps millions of people who can bring the weight of their voices to bear on this. So it's really about Sarah. It's about people understanding the issues and continue to talk and engage with the government. So I can imagine if more than 70 million Nigerians rise up, which forms perhaps uh, less than 40 percent of the Nigerian population, and demand that everyone in the National Assembly must toe the line of this advocacy to get Senator Ningi restated. 
been done in the Green Chamber. That has got, but they can't be falling down the powers to do so. That is why we need to continue this conversation. We will come to of course, to answer your question in the simplest terms. If uh, this call is not needed, but more importantly, Nigerians need to press it on to ensure that those National Assembly uh, do the will of the people. Okay. So if it's going to be reinstated, here is my worry. With things like this that has happened, do you think there might be some form of witch hunting? Because now all eyes are on him. So obviously some of his colleagues who are not happy with what he has done will start to find ways to just frustrate him out of this. So what do you think is going to be the, the, you know, the preceding events that might even happen for Senator Ningi? As much as I don't want to make this about personalities and persons, they're about issues. Senator Ninja is, uh, is an experienced politician. He has been in national since 1989. So I might as well say that he knows how to take care of himself. Mm. But much more importantly, because the whistleblower has recognized by the all uh, convention, which is why he gave the, the president needs to come in, he needs to be able to protect him, as it were, from the consequences of what he has done as a whistleblower. But much more importantly, those allegations need. Uh, to be investigated. So I'm sure that he, he will find a way to protect himself from whatever backlash it is. And of course, Nigerians and their organizations like Sheriff are there to also ensure we, that when he's restated, he's also protected within the context of the whistleblower policy that we have in Nigeria, which is why this is another reason why the president must also move to sign the whistleblower bill. As in, the former president did not sign it, and this national assembly should pass the law. Mm. to create a robust framework for people to call out corruption to ensure that they are protected. Perhaps it gives Senator Nigi and the Petos to champion the bill now in the House mm -hmm. to ensure that it is passed. Perhaps. Yeah. Perhaps. I mean, that might just happen. And hopefully it does. Because I, I would say that I think that was a very bold move. Not everybody can have some form of integrity, especially when you're dealing with other people, like, I mean, there are other people involved and sometimes you might get scared. But I think it was a very bold move for him to come out and say, no, this is not what was signed or this is not what we had discussed earlier. There's something fishy here. Um, and I just hope that, you know, he gets reinstated with Sarah calling for his, um, for him to be reinstated and even other Nigerians as well. And I really hope that Nigerians, you know, come up and we start to bring our voices together because we're louder when we speak together as one. So, um, but yes, we want to say thank you for coming. It's always a pleasure having a conversation with you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. All right. Okay, we've been speaking with Kolawale Oluwadare. He's the deputy director for SEREP, and we've been talking about what's going on in the National Assembly. Well, since he is representative SEREP, um, SEREP has recalled, has asked rather, the Senate to recall Ningi immediately back um, to the House of Assembly. But yes, this is where we have to draw the curtain on the show today. It's been amazing having a breakfast with you. My name is Rome Paulson. I'll see you again tomorrow. Have a good day.